Hi there from St. Bonaventure University. I'm Dr. Renee Hauser. I am the chair of the Masters in Special Education program at St. Bonaventure. And I'm here with you today um, with my student, Sarah Koning, who has been doing some emergency online instruction for students with disabilities. And we're gonna talk to you about some strategies you can use. And she's actually gonna show you a demonstration lesson that she has done. So first of all, let's talk about why we're here. Uh, we're here because of COVID-19. Um, which you're all aware of. Um, because of COVID-19, millions of students across the country have been forced and transitioned very quickly into emergency online schooling, So, um, which is different from online instruction. Online instruction traditionally means that the teacher has prepared to teach online and um, has formatted things for, for specifically for online instruction. Emergency online schooling means that there's very little or no preparation time, and now students are um, in an online format. Many of us are experiencing that. In addition to emergency online schooling and the quick transition, we still have millions of students with disabilities that require specialized instruction. So those specialized instruction needs still need to be met. Teachers across the country have been using a variety of different methods to, to do this emergency schooling with their students. Um, some stu many teachers sent packets home that was a start. Um, so they sent packets of work home for the, for, the te for the parents to do with the students or for the students to do. Um, many teachers are recording video lessons. Many teachers are meeting in small group or individual sessions with students. And many teachers um, are engaging in training of parents, especially teachers of young children, to train the parents what to do. So this requires a lot of work on the teacher's part. Teachers are using a variety of different instructional platforms. These are just some of the, the major ones that teachers might be using. Zoom has been used across the board. Um, many people probably hadn't even heard of Zoom prior to um, emergency online teaching, but now it, it's everybody's best friend. Google Hangouts is another um, platform that teachers are using, as well as Skype. Uh, Vimeo, which is another video conferencing platform. Teachers are also recording um, videos and putting them on YouTube in secured um, private channels so that they're not available to the general public. And also Screencastify is a Microsoft tool that, that teachers are using to be able to um, record their lessons and share their lessons with students. So what Sarah's gonna do is she's gonna share with us some of the strategies that she's been using as well as share a lesson with us. So Sarah, it's all yours. Hi everyone. So some of the different strategies that I have been using throughout this time is that I have been in constant contact and having communication with both with both teachers and parents. I've been having communication with them through the through phone, through Facebook groups and different applications like that. I've been using Zoom to make many lessons to share on social media for parents to use as resources. So particularly to make my mini lessons, I've been using PowerPoint and Microsoft Whiteboard, which acts like a smart board, and I've been making engaging presentations and recording myself using Zoom. Um, I've also been using Zoom to have different classroom meetings with my class that I'm in currently interning in. And through those classroom meetings, it's a time just for, all, for our, um, ourselves as a class to talk together, and then also a time to set up different individual or small group meetings. And this is really a time for us to talk and have different instruction, especially with the students who have with disabilities, so they are still getting that one-on-one -on -one support and different services that they need. And then I've also been using Facebook groups through my classroom and Class Dojo to send out practice worksheets. Class Dojo is a secure platform with a group privacy setting, so it's a chance for me to share different information, share different pictures, um, videos of myself, like you can see the ones below of different mini lessons I've been doing for my classes, or just um, a chance for me to read a book and send it out to my class. Down here, these images are different mini lessons that I've completed so far. And I try to make these videos as engaging as possible. And I pretend as if I, my whole class were in front of me just to make it more engaging for the students. So as you can see, I've done a variety of different phonics lessons and math lessons. So this video is an example of a math mini lesson I um, did for my second grade inclusion classroom. In the video, you're just gonna see a small clip of it, but I, um, you will see that I sca um, scaffolded my instruction for my students. 
So some different ways that I did this was by using just different colored markers that I do with my, that I work with my small group in different language. So for example, you might hear me say the word marshmallow or french fries during this. Um, my students, they refer as a marshmallow to represent the ones place and a french fry to represent the tens place. So this is a small clip of this lesson. Let's try some more together. You can use a piece of paper or the whiteboard if you just want to follow along. Feel free to do some more problems with me. For my next problem, I'm going to do 63 plus 57. To help use this, I'm going to use my hundreds, tens, and ones chart to help me solve this problem. The first thing I'm going to do is look at the number 63. And I'm going to ask myself, how many tens do I have in 63? Right, I have six tens in 63. So I'm going to draw six tens in my tens column. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then I'm going to ask myself, how many ones do I have in 63? Right, I have three ones in the number 63. So I'm going to draw three ones or three marshmallows in my ones column. One, two, three. Six tens and three ones represent 63. Moving on, I'm going to look at my number 57 and I'm going to ask myself, how many tens do I have in 57? Right. I have five tens in the number 57. So I'm going to draw five french fries or five tens to represent that in my tens column. One, two, three, four, five. Now I'm going to ask myself, how many ones do I have in the number 57? Right, seven. So I'm going to draw seven ones or seven marshmallow in my ones column to represent 57. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Five tens and seven ones represents 57. Now I'm ready to solve. I know that I start in my, before I do this, I wanna see if I can do any regrouping. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is in my ones column. And I'm going to remind myself that 10 ones equals 110. Can I make a regroup here? Can I make a, can I make any of my, ten, my ones into a 10? Yes, I can. Because I see that I have 10 ones and I know that I can regroup that to make 110. I'm gonna cross that off so I don't get confused. Now I'm going to ask myself, can I regroup any of my tens to make one 100? Yes, I can. Awesome job. I know that 10 tens equals one 100. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I'm going to lasso these tens up and move it to my hundreds place. And I'm going to cross it off so I don't get confused. That's all the regrouping I can do. So now I'm going to solve. I'm going to start in my ones place first because ones always comes first. I have no ones left, so I need to put down a zero to represent zero ones. I have one, two, two tens, and one hundred. One hundred, two tens, and zero ones equals one hundred and twenty. Now I'm going to solve it a different way using my traditional style. I'm going to do the same thing. I know that I can add in any order and I'm going to start in my ones place because ones always comes first. So instead of doing three plus seven, I'm going to do seven plus three to make it a little easier. So seven plus three is seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to put my ones down, so my zero, and my one or my tens place is gonna go next door. I'm gonna ask myself, six plus five is six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, 11 plus one more is 12. I'm going to write the number 12. 120 and 120 equal each other, so my answer must be correct. So that is an excellent example of a variety of different scaffolds that were built into a lesson. Congratulations, Sarah. That was great. Thank you. Um, a couple of things that she did, just so I can point out the strategies, is the primary thing that you might notice is she provided a model, a model, two models actually, of how to solve the problem. In addition to that model, she did what's called a think aloud. She took the thinking that was going on in her head about how she was going to solve this problem and articulated it for her students. That is an extremely powerful way of teaching strategies to students by telling them exactly what you're thinking. The other thing that she did, and some of you might have noticed this and some of you might have not, when she was um, answering the problem in the traditional way um, over on the, the left hand side, she used what's called touch math or points that when she took the larger number, she then touched specific points on the number. Many students in our elementary schools know touch math. If you are unfamiliar with it, you can simply Google it and it will teach you how to do it. Rather than counting on fingers or drawing objects, touch math gives students an, a, um, a scaffold that is much less intrusive and it helps them to figure out how to add the numbers together. The, the transition from touch math to mental math is much quicker than it is from actually drawing pictures or counting on your fingers. So that was a great job, Sarah. Can you point out any other scaffolds that you used or did I did we hit them all, do you think? I think you hit them all for the most part. An other additional thing that I did was that this video was sent directly to my class Facebook group. So parents and students were able to access and watch it together. After that, I then sent out a practice worksheet And then after doing that, I individually emailed parents so that they could so that they could practice um, different addition problems with their children that would meet their own children's individual needs. For example, one of my students who have um, with a disability, one of their goals is to work on their addition word problems. So instead of having these math problems set up the traditional way, I made some into word problems, and then she was able to use the different strategies from the video and also work on her one of her IEP goals. How time would it have taken you to teach this lesson in a classroom? In a classroom, this would probably be, we do different differentiated instruction math groups in our classroom. So this would be a mini lesson as a whole group and it would probably take about um, 10 to 15 minutes to teach as a and whole. And how much time did it take you to do everything uh, online to teach this lesson? about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. it, it is definitely a lot more time consuming, but I can tell with a smile on your face that you feel that you're meeting <laughs> the needs of your students and that is, I, it is a challenge that you're rising to. I really do and I think it's really important and great that teachers aren't losing hope and that we are still taking time because the number one thing that comes first is our students, so. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much and thank you all thank for you. tuning in. Have a wonderful day and wash your hands.